Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the final part of this three-part webinar series, very kindly hosted by Zatarla on risk management in the mining sector. My name is Imon Chandel, and I am head of events and also look after conference partnerships at WIM UK. You may also know me from the Oxford Mining Club at the Natural Resources Forum, so a big welcome to all of you. I am just going to run through the usual few housekeeping points. If you could be so kind to keep your mics on mute, that would be greatly appreciated. You will see your cameras have been turned off as we are following a traditional webinar format. And please direct all your questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We are recording today's webinar as we have done part one and part two. So please feel free to check back in a couple of days for all the links. If this is your first time joining us on the series, I would like to once again introduce you to Dr. Sarah Gordon. Having completed her PhD at Imperial College, Sarah then went on to work as a geologist for Anglo-American. She was lucky enough to live and work in Canada, Brazil, Southern Africa and Europe in a variety of functions from exploration through to sustainability, risk management and assurance. This grounding allowed her to explore different risk management techniques and uses, applying them to real situations. Sarah co-founded Sotarla in 2014 and now with 80 associates based around the world and offices in London, Sydney, Johannesburg and Toronto, Sitarla provides risk management consultancy, training and research to organizations from sectors such as healthcare, agriculture, charities, finance, together with petrochemicals, energy, oil and gas, and of course mining. Sarah is an honorary lecturer at Imperial College London and a research associate at the University of Johannesburg voted as one of the 100 Global Inspirational Women in Mining in the 2016 edition of WIM 100. She is also a trustee of geology for global development. So for the last time in this series, I would like to hand over to Sarah. Brilliant, thank you very, very much, Imone. Um, you're getting very good at that now. Maybe we'll I am. <laughs> change up the biography for next time. So. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning into today's session, uh, where we will be talking through risk management in the mining sector. Um, and what you'll see is that risk management within mining is actually not that different from risk management anywhere else, but there are some nuances and uh, there are some ways in which we can really simplify it to make it truly valuable for mining as a whole. So if I just move to share my screen, so hopefully everybody should be able to see that. Um, we're going to start off the presentation with what is risk and risk management and then we're going to zoom in on risk management within mining and as ever this is a case where we are encouraging you to be as interactive as possible so just to get things rolling we've got a Mentimeter little um, quiz for you and what you'll be able to do is if you go to menti.com either on your computers or on your phone and use the code 1574, you will be confronted with a word cloud with the question, what do you think are the biggest risks faced by the mining sector? I would be really interested to see what you think the biggest risks are, and we'll pull that into the presentation later on. So, what do we mean by risk and risk management? Well, risk is all about those uncertain opportunities or threats that if they occur, are gonna impact on our abilities to achieve our objectives. Often when people talk about risk, they only think about the bad stuff. They only think about the hazards or the threats or the, the nasty stuff that could happen. But actually, when we're talking about risk as a whole, we're also talking about those potential opportunities that we might want to put on the table, especially when we're trying to look at what is the true value of managing those risks. And this can be wrapped up in the definition of risk, um, as for example, given to us by one of the most commonly used international definitions or international standards, ISO 31000. ISO 31000 defines risk as being the effect of uncertainty 
on our objectives. And there are three important words in that. The first one is effect. And what we mean by that is potential good effect or pros, but also potential bad effect or cons. The second important work is that of uncertainty. And for a risk to be a risk, there has to be an element of uncertainty. If you know everything about something, it's not going to be a risk at all. So there has to be an element of uncertainty. That uncertainty can be small or it can be large. So it could be small in that, am I, um, what time am I going to finish this presentation? Um, or is my, my partner going to walk back through the door again that you've just seen him walk through? So that would be a small element of uncertainty. Or is it a large element of uncertainty? For example, what's going to happen with COVID-19 in the future? The third important word in this is that of objectives. So for a risk to be a risk, it has to impact on whatever it is that we are attempting to do at that point in time or going into the future. So that's what we mean by risk. And when we look to risk management, we're looking at doing something about those risks. There are many, many different definitions for what we mean by risk management, but bringing it down to its simplest level, we're talking about doing something about those risks. Now, there are many different processes that we can use for risk management. Some of them are more complicated than others, but all of them can be boiled down to four very, very simple steps. Step number one is defining the context in which we are attempting to operate, be that our internal context or be it our external context and also what are the objectives that we are actually trying to achieve within that context, bearing in mind that that context is probably ever changing. Okay, so we're looking at what is going on with regards to that context, but also what are we trying to actually achieve? The second point that we're looking at here is, so we've got our definition of our context and our objectives. Number two, we're looking at, okay, let's assess our risks. And when we're assessing our risks, we've got three different component parts within that. A, what might our risks be? So identifying those risks. B, let's understand those risks. And C, so what? Do we actually need to do anything about those risks that we're talking about? So identifying our risks, understanding our risks, and then so, saying, so what? Do we actually need to do anything about them? That then takes us into step number three, which is probably the most important bit of risk management. But typically, when people are doing risk assessments, they don't actually get this far. So the third step is all about managing our risks. So taking control of that uncertainty and trying to steer those risks in the direction in which we want them to travel. And it's in this managing of risks category, and this is where we get all of our controls, et cetera, coming to bear. Once we've done step number three, we go to step number four, which is where we have all of our monitoring, our reviewing, our reporting. And this is where we're doing all the verification of whether those controls that we put in place during the management of our risks are actually working. But also, is our context changing? Are our risks changing within that context? Or in fact, are our objectives changing as well? So that all comes into the monitoring, review and reporting. And as you can see, we then have that fourth arrow that goes all the way back into step number one again, therefore completing our circle, that very simple risk-based decision-making process. And it's that final arrow, which is probably the most important one because it allows us to ask ourselves, Given the context in which we're attempting to operate and the objectives that we're trying to achieve and the potential opportunities or threats that could impact on our ability to achieve those objectives, i.e. those risks, and our ability to manage them, is it actually possible to achieve those objectives? If the answer is yes, then great. You've got everything in balance and you can carry on. If the answer is no, then you've got two options you can either pump more time, money, efforts into the management of those risks, or you can change your objectives and you can move those goalposts. Because sometimes we find that, especially when our context changes dramatically, 
there is no way that we will be able to achieve those original objectives. And so therefore, we have to change them. And this is something that a lot of organizations are going through at the moment. Organizations are reframing what their objectives are for the next few months, the next few years, because we've all received such a big surprise with regards to COVID-19. So why do we manage those risks themselves? Well, there are many, many different reasons why we might want to manage our risks. It might be because we need to introduce some sort of consistency and decision making across our organization as a whole. We might want to understand what are our tolerance levels for taking certain risks. It might be because we want to increase our confidence in our ability to be able to achieve certain objectives or improve certain types of quality or service that we might be operating. Um, also, it might be to help us retain or build our reputation or brand. And finally, it might be because we want to get a higher return on our investment or perhaps a more consistent return on our investment as a whole. We also manage our risks because in many codes of governance around the world, we're instructed to do so. So risk management is one of those things that our boards of directors expect from us. They will be expecting audit to feed through some form of assurance with regards to what's going on across our organization, but they often rely on risk management to actually provide an element of transparency with regards to what's really happening within the organization as well. So therefore risk management isn't just a good idea because it allows us or it increases the chances of us achieving our objectives. It's also part of our own regulations and governance that we often have. But more than that, we manage our risks because, especially from a mining perspective, we really, really don't want catastrophes such as Brumadinho to happen again or similar events to happen elsewhere in the world. And it's not just Brumadinho, it might be other mines around the world or it might be social unrest or it might be us cheating ourselves where we are lying to one another with regards to how much gold we think might be in the ground. And it's not just big scale mining or large scale mining, it's also artisanal and small scale mining as well. Everybody can make use of risk management. And in fact, everybody does make use of risk management on a daily basis. And it's not just about large scale mining, small scale mining, or stopping the bad stuff from happening. It's also about enabling opportunities. It's about us being enabled to find that cobalt in the ground, which is so vital for the technology that we're surrounded by, but also as well, simple technology, such as light bulbs and electricity. We need all of this in the ground. So as mining companies, we have to be able to take those risks in a balanced fashion in order to be able to extract and process those commodities that we need. So why do we need risk management? We need them for all those different reasons I've just explained. But what do we need in place in order to be able to do our risk management? And again, there are lots and lots of international standards that inform us with regards to what it is we think we might need. Um, but if we zoom in on this, firstly, we need some principles. So what does good risk management look like? And there are many different ways of articulating this. But a simple way to talk about good risk management for you is to say that your risk management needs to be proportionate to the requirements of your organization or your team. In mining, we are not the same as a bank. So therefore, the type of risk management that we probably need to use is going to be tailored and is going to be proportionate to what we need in the mining sector compared to what a bank or an insurance company, for example, might make use of. Secondly, our risk management should ideally be aligned to all of the other systems and processes, et cetera, that we have in place within the organization as a whole. So risk management should not be something extra that we tap on the side. It should be aligned and it should be integrated into all of those other systems and processes that we have in place. Third, Ideally, the risk management should be comprehensive enough to pull in the right level of data and detail that we need in order to be able to make those decisions that we require. OK, so it needs to be comprehensive enough and detailed enough to enable us to be able to do that. 
Number four, it needs to be embedded into everything that we're doing. So ideally it's present throughout the entirety of the organization and it's part of all those decisions that are being made from the front line, say with regards to health and safety, all the way through to board level where we're talking about strategic decisions for the long term. And finally, our risk management needs to be dynamic. It isn't something that we update every six months or every three months and take to the board. It is something that needs to be able to anticipate where there will be changes in our context and therefore our risks and therefore our controls. So we can proactively manage those risks rather than constantly being on the back foot and only reacting to those changes. So firstly, we need those principles and those principles could be something like proportionate, aligned, comprehensive, embedded, and dynamic, which handily spells the word paced. Secondly, we need some form of framework, and the framework provides us with all of the nuts and bolts that we need in order to be able to make that risk management work. And that framework will include things like our risk strategy. So that can include things like our philosophy for risk management, or what do we actually want to do with it? Some companies decide that they only want to use risk management so that they tick those compliance boxes. So they therefore they meet those regulatory requirements. Whereas other organizations decide that they actually want to use risk management to drive positive change and be very proactive and actually create the culture within the organization. So from a framework perspective, we use our risk strategy to determine what do we actually want to use risk management for. Secondly, our risk architecture provides us with the overview as to the roles and responsibilities. So what does the CEO need to do with regards to risk management within our organization, all the way through to what does the head of audit need to do, what does the board member need to do, what does a geologist need to do with regards to risk management. But also, how about those external stakeholders and what are our roles with regards to risk management in terms of them? So risk architecture includes things like roles and responsibilities. It will also include things like our schedule for when we undertake risk management, et cetera, as a whole. And so the schedule is important for us because that also drives our reporting structure. So how do we escalate risks, especially when they are changing incredibly quickly? Finally, with regards to that, we might talk about our data management. So what is going on with regards to looking after the data that we have? And are we using a piece of software? Or perhaps we're just housing all of this data within Excel, all of which is perfectly acceptable. We just need to understand what the limits are with regards to those different levels. The final thing that we have usually within our framework are all of our risk protocols, techniques and tools. So how do we actually analyze all of that data, et cetera, that will usually come through in our risk framework. The final component part that we have here is our risk management process. And that brings us back to that very simple four step process that we talked through slightly earlier on, where we're looking at that definition of the context and objectives. How do we assess our risks? How do we manage our risks? And finally, what about the monitoring, reviewing and reporting of our risks? Now, this is something that is not done in isolation. It is something that is done throughout the entirety of our organization. And I'm sure that many of us are very, very good at, say, health and safety risk management. And so therefore, we're very used to talking about things like hazards. We're used to talking about threats. And that is the world generally of health, health and safety risk management. The problem is that health and safety risk management talks about risk in a way that somebody from the financial world of risk management doesn't have a clue. They have no idea what health and safety risk management specialists are talking about. But conversely, those financial risk management experts will be talking about things like reverse stress testing and capacity acetation, et cetera, et cetera, which are things that a health and safety risk management expert won't understand about at all. So when we're talking about enterprise risk management, one of the keys here is to acknowledge where there is really, really good work going on in those specialist disciplines, but also then be able to simplify it down so we can actually understand what one another mean. And an easy way to do that is to boil it down to this really simple four-step process, because that will be common across all of those different disciplines 
of specialist areas of risk management. It's also something that is undertaken across the entirety of the organisation, all the way from the front line up to the very senior levels in the organisation. So as you can see portrayed by this picture here, our risk management almost acts as a cascade tool with regards to our objectives, but also an escalation tool where we're seeing risks change or controls perhaps not being strong enough to manage those risks, which may cause a problem somewhere else in the organisation. That takes me on to the fact that traditionally, risks were managed in silos, they were managed in isolation, and people got very, very good at putting a fence around key areas of risk. And that is nice and easy from a management perspective, but unfortunately, it's not how the real world works. And the real world, world looks more like this, it looks more like a network where one person's risk might be somebody else's cause, might be somebody else's consequence, and when one thing changes, there tends to be that domino effect all the way through that network, causing opportunities or threats, or a bit of both, to happen all at the same time. And so when we're looking at those risks, we need to be cognizant that they happen in a network. They don't happen in isolation, they don't happen in silos. And it's this that actually is causing some of the biggest shifts with regards to how we actually manage risk within the mining sector as a whole. And that neatly takes me on to risk management within mining. So risk management within mining, there are many, many, many different international standards that we can lean on to help us manage risk within mining. But within mining, we have almost invented a slightly more complicated or complex way of doing risk management compared to many other similar sectors around the world. And that's causing us quite a lot of problems because if risk management should be nice and simple, like this four step process, even the simplest mining standard for risk management, the, the fewest number of steps it contains is nine steps. And this is something that as a sector, we're trying to reverse our way out of at the moment and trying to understand why have we made risk management so complicated and also why are we making our risks so siloed rather than enabling ourselves to see them as that interconnected network. So why do we make it, why do we make risk management so complicated? Well, it's for a number of different reasons. And this is a case here where um, it might be a case where risk management, if I just fix this slide for you for a second, um, where risk management might have our top-down approach for managing risk. So these are all the requirements for managing risk that somebody from the executive or the board level or a senior level of management, this is generally why they want to manage risk. They want to manage risk because they have an obligation to a regulator or to their investors to show what the risks are. There will always be a level of compliance. Traditionally, this type of risk management is usually dominated by your financial risk reporting. And also we might be looking at the balancing of a portfolio of risk across different projects. So that's what risk management traditionally looks like from the top end of an organization. If we now flip that round and say, what does risk management look like from the bottom end of the organization coming up? It looks like generally people trying to keep people safe on the ground. So there's a massive focus on health and safety, coupled with the desire to maximize production, obviously within that safe environment. We'll probably also talk about things like environmental, social, security, human rights, etc. So all of that kind of stuff coming together on the ground, as well as delivering projects on time. Now what you can see is that the drivers or the rationale for doing risk management, if you look at the top down versus the bottom up, is quite different. And so as a result, you get lots of tension or stress between those two drivers. And as a result, what companies tend to do is to invent incredibly complicated risk management systems, but actually it could be very, very, very simple. And the key for doing this is to start thinking about the future and what everybody wants to get out of risk management in the future. So generally from a top-down perspective, we are moving towards that greater focus on responsible mining or environment, social and governance. And if you want to hear more about that, 
go and take a look at our recording from last week's webinar on responsible mining um, and sourcing of materials. Secondly, the top-down pool is wanting to have a, a clearer statement of risk appetite and tolerance and also long-term viability for the organisation as, as a whole. So how much risk can we actually weather or can we tolerate within our businesses? There will also be an expectation by shareholders for faster reporting and awareness of what's actually going on on the ground or across the company. And also there is that move to integrated enterprise-wide risk management, something that has really been enabled over the last few years by improved computing power. From the bottom up perspective in the future, we are seeing increasingly the requirement from the top for more information. They want to see more about what's going on on the ground. And this might tie in nicely to where we do collect loads more data compared to what we used to collect. And so therefore we can use that to give us an impression of that risk profile for the organization. At ground level, we also want to be able to balance our risks and similar to that top-down approach, we want to be able to move to that integrated enterprise-wide risk management as a whole. And what does this look like? It looks like sandwiching it all together and recognizing those risks as they truly are in a network. So this is a case here where for mining, especially those companies where they've had risk management in place for many, many years and they find it incredibly complicated, the way to simplify it actually is to recognize what do those different users of risk management really want, how, what do they actually need, and so therefore how can we simplify that system down. If you're really lucky in that perhaps your organization's quite new to risk management, you can start with this viewpoint straight from the start. And you can start using that very simple four-step process to be able to identify, understand, and manage those risks in a single dynamic process where you can see those risks across the entirety of the organization. So with regards to this, there are lots and lots of different ways in which you can very simply make sure your risk management is truly dynamic and is truly giving you value across all levels of the organization. And I'm just gonna move into some practical hints and tips for doing that, especially with regards to mining. Now, for those of you who are an expert in risk management within mining, we spend a lot of our time talking about controls and more than that, critical controls. Now, putting the word critical on the beginning of controls is something that is quite unique to mining. Most other sectors just talk about controls. And a control is something that will actively take charge of some of that uncertainty with regards to one of your risks. So for a control to be a control, it has to make active change on your risks, okay? So you're looking for something that is going to actively change your risks. And this little flow chart here is something that has only been put together over the last few years. It is combined from lots of different sectors and lots of different research. Um, and it's work that Satala has been doing. Um, but it's something that is incredibly useful if you're trying to work out if that control or that thing that you're holding in your hand is in fact a true control and is in fact going to help you change that risk. And you can do that by asking yourself three questions. Question number one, does this thing, which might be a task, object, act, system, does it only collect or analyze data? So therefore, is it something like a thermometer? Is it something like an inspection? Is it a review? Is it an audit? If that's all it's doing, and it requires somebody to use that information that it's collecting, so doing something with that data. If all you're talking about is data collection, then that by itself is not changing anything. So therefore, it is not a control. So anytime you see somebody write thermometer or inspection or audit as a control on their risk register, maybe gently suggest to them that that is a fantastic input to a control, but it's not the actual control itself. So a pisometer does not stop a tailings dam from failing. It collects really important information on that tailings dam, but unless someone or something does something with that data that the pisometer is collecting, who cares? You could have as many pisometers as you like, but you're not actively managing that tailings dam. Question number two, does that thing, so that act, object, system, task, etc. Does it only provide guidance or support? 
And by that we mean, is it a procedure? Is it a standard? It might be training, it might be an alarm. Those by themselves, unless you actively use them, is not changing anything. So this again might be a vital part of the control because it might tell someone what it is that they need to do or it might provide the parameters for a machine if a machine is the thing that is actually performing the control. But in itself, a procedure by itself is just a document on a shelf or in a filing system. You actively need to use it for it to really be a control. And so that then takes us into question number three. Does this thing actively change the risk? Is it changing the uncertainty or the potential impact of that risk? And if the answer is yes, now we are into control territory. And those are the things that we're really looking at for our real controls. Now, as you can see here from the diagram, yes, your guidance might be a vital component part of that control. Similarly, your data collection might be a vital part of that control. But when it comes to verifying if your controls are actually working or if they are truly effective, the bit of this system that you want to be verifying is the control itself. I've worked with many, many different mining companies over the years where people spend weeks, months, years collecting data on just do we still have a piezometer in our tailings dam or has someone stolen it overnight? If you are just checking if the piezometer is still there or if you're just checking if there is a procedure on how to manage your tailings dam, you're not truly checking whether your control is going to be effective because neither the piezometer by itself or the procedure for managing the tailings dam by itself are truly controls. You need to be looking for the active management of that tailings dam as a whole. So focusing in on your real controls is incredibly important. And this little process flow here is a really simple way to weed out all of those things that are just contributing factors to controls rather than the real controls themselves to then allow you to say, okay, of that list of controls that we've got, are there some that are gonna make more difference to that risk than others. And those controls that are going to make a really massive difference to that risk, sometimes we term those critical controls. Now I'm acutely aware that there are many different definitions for this within mining, but basically across the sector, a critical control is one of those controls that is going to make a massive difference. Or to be honest, you wouldn't turn the piece of kit on if it wasn't in place, because that control is definitely going to save your life. So controls, focus in on those real controls. The second aspect that we're gonna look at is include all of the risks from as many different perspectives as possible. And what we have here on the screen in front of you are a whole series of different pictures that you guys submitted last week. When we asked you at the beginning of last week's webinar on responsible mining, what did you perceive a mine to be? And as you can see from all of the great pictures that came in, we've got people who I suspect are engineers, we've got people who I suspect are geologists, we've got people who I suspect are more on the communication side or the financial side of mining, or perhaps we've got people who are just interested. I know, for example, that my mum was listening in last week, so mum, I hope that your picture is up here on the board. So this is a case here where everybody has their own perspective with regards to what the world looks like. And so therefore they bring their own story to the table with regards to what they think the risks are. And this can then be encapsulated as that network throughout the organization, both with regards to what people think the risks are internal to the organization, but also external, as you can see in the right hand diagram here somebody in the front line may perceive a risk to look very very different compared to somebody at the top end of the organization or at board level the other thing that we can look at here is are these risks acknowledged or are they unacknowledged and to talk through this what i'm going to do is i'm actually going to stop sharing my screen and i'm going to spotlight my little video there so hopefully you can all see me and you're now going to watch me draw on my wall which is a little bit dangerous but with regards to acknowledged risks and unacknowledged risks what we can do is we can split our wall into four quadrants and what we can do in the top right hand quadrant up here we can say here we have known knowns and if we have known knowns we know everything about a risk so therefore or sorry i should say we know everything about the thing that we're talking about 
So therefore, these things up here, they're not risks. These things are actually facts. Generally, they've happened. Sometimes we call these things issues. We might call these things events. We might call these things incidents, etc. There's lots of different language that we can use for these facts. If we now come down into our bottom right hand corner, here we have known unknowns. And in this quadrant down here, this is where we have our risks because now we have an element of uncertainty or the unknowns is bringing in that element of uncertainty. And these are the risks that we we'll probably have on our risk registers and these risks might be acknowledged risks because we're talking about them within our organisations. We then come into the bottom left hand quadrant and over here we have our unknown unknowns. And these things here are risks that will truly surprise us if they happen, okay? So these surprises, which are risks, are ones that it's impossible to see before they happen. They might be very, very apparent with hindsight, but we cannot anticipate them by pure definition. Sometimes these are the risks that we call black swans. And the reason why black swans are called black swans is because for most of us around the world, we grew up thinking that all swans were white. Whereas a few hundred years ago, some intrepid explorers got on a boat and went all the way to Western Australia, where swans are typically black. And those sailors were so surprised that those swans were black, that that was the thing that really surprised them, not the kangaroos or the koalas or any of the other wonderful animals that of course you can get in Australia. So a black swan is a risk that is a true surprise, okay? We don't anticipate it. That then takes us into our final quadrant up here, where we have known unknowns. So these guys up here, they are risks, but these ones are unacknowledged risks. Okay, so these are the ones that we're not necessarily talking about in our organizations. People know about them, but they're not pointing their fingers at them. They're not doing something about them. And it's these risks here, which are sometimes called the elephants, as in the elephant in the room. And the real value in risk management is to get people to point their fingers at these elephants and to move them down into our acknowledged risks territory. Because that way we can take these elephants and we can then begin to understand them and we can begin to do something about them. What we don't want to happen is for an elephant to go straight to a fact. Because those are the situations where, say for example, there is a safety incident and you're doing the investigation and someone says, oh, I could have told you that was going to happen. And you think, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't we share that information and move it down to the acknowledged territory and do something before Bob lost his arm or whatever the case might be? And it's not just about bad stuff. It can also be good stuff as well. There may be opportunities that we might want to bring down into this acknowledged risks territory down here. And this is important because the more information we share across an organization, the fewer black swans or the fewer surprises that we will experience as a company as a whole. And this identification of elephants, this exercise right here is massively, massively influential at all levels within actually any organization, not just mining, but in almost every single risk workshop that I run over the years, when you start asking people what are their elephants this is when you truly begin to understand what are those things that are worrying people in the back of their heads that perhaps they've either assumed that somebody else is doing something about them or for sensitivity reasons they don't really feel that they can raise, um, raise them or perhaps risk management itself has put a great big fence along here by saying we only want to hear about those risks that are either going to significantly hurt somebody or cost us a lot of money or damage our reputation, etc. Actually, ideally, we want to hear about all of it because what somebody think one person thinks is unimportant, somebody else might think is massively important from their perspective. So our swans and our elephants is a really, really useful tool to be able to use within mining as a whole. And in fact, within any form of risk management. So swans and elephants and what you can do here, of course, is think that yes, elephants exist for many, many different reasons. And what we're trying to do is move Dumbo the elephant 
down into the acknowledged territory so that we can really deal with those elephants and reduce the total number of swans. The third thing to mention is just to acknowledge the fact that risks, to be honest, are always changing. So they're changing either because our external context is changing or they're also changing because within mining, we're constantly moving through that value chain. So hopefully we're moving from exploration into project, into operation, into closure. And actually a lot of our big risks that we find, especially in the operational stage, are ones that have been seeded all the way back in exploration. So those exploration geologists, and I used to be an exploration geologist, we are much more important than people give us credit for because if we don't get it right, and if we're not good at identifying those risks, not just the ones to do with rocks, all the way up at the exploration stage, we can destroy a project when it gets to operation or project phase. And similarly, when we're operating, if we're not thinking about those risks associated with closure, we might actually end up with an asset that is impossible to close or just too costly to close because we haven't been doing that remediation as we've gone through that operation. For those of you who missed the first webinar that we did and are wondering what on earth we're talking about with regards to exploration project etc i encourage you to go back and look at that webinar and also pick up our free mining fact sheet that we've got because that will just give you some background to that the fourth hint that we've got for you is that risk bow ties now risk bow ties are very very common tool within mining and in fact in mining we make more use of the risk bow tie than any other sector Believe it or not, there are sectors out there that have never heard of the risk bow tie being a risk management tool. And for any of you who have not heard of a risk bow tie before, it's fantastic. It's a very simple way through which we can better understand our risks, both through what that risk actually means, but also how we might want to manage it. And you complete a risk bow tie in five simple steps. Number one, put the risk in the middle, okay? Put the risk in the focal point. And it doesn't matter if you can't articulate it properly, just put something in there. Step number two, identify all those potential positive consequences and negative consequences should that risk occur. Now, if you can't think of any consequences, that suggests that the thing in the middle isn't even a risk. So that therefore means that you can stop the exercise right there or you can think about moving that risk one step to the right hand side so the risk becomes a consequence if however you do have lots of consequences you can look at the positive consequences and the negative consequences and say okay on balance do i want this risk to happen or not and it's at that point in time whether where you define is your risk a potential opportunity or is it a potential threat Having decided that, we go on to step number three, where you identify all of the things that might cause that risk to happen. And in step number three, you can just stick those different ideas up there. It doesn't matter if they're direct causes or indirect causes, just get them up there because you can sort them out later. Then you go into steps four and five, and this is where we talk about our controls. And here there's lots of different terminology that different companies use, but basically you have proactive controls that will proactively influence whether that risk is actually going to happen. So if the risk in the middle is a potential threat, your proactive control should try to stop that threat from occurring, okay? Whereas on the right hand side of your bow tie, you have your reactive controls and your reactive controls won't stop the risk from happening, but they will help you to manage those consequences and therefore make sure or try and reduce the chance of those nasty threats occurring as a result or those nasty bad consequences happening, but maybe increase the chances of the good consequences happening. An example of this would be something like insurance. So insurance doesn't necessarily stop something from going wrong, but it reactively helps you to reduce the potential financial penalty or whatever it is you're doing. So insurance would be an example of a reactive control. Now, yes, you have to pay for the insurance in advance of that thing going wrong, but it's only effective after the risk has occurred. So the difference between proactive and reactive is where those controls are actually effective. Now, your risk bow ties are things that can occur throughout the organization. And personally, I love a risk bow tie. As you can see, there are many, many risk bow tie exercises that I have done in my time. So be it the ones on the left hand side where you use lots of post-it notes 
or perhaps on the right hand side where you start to bring in control monitoring data sets etc so there's lots of stuff that you can bring into a risk bow tie which is brilliant hints number five Within risk management, we are very, very used to looking at impact against likelihood graphs that are coloured in red, amber, green, etc. And we often spend a huge amount of time trying to work out which rating we should assign to our risks. Now, the purpose of our impact against likelihood matrices is purely to prioritise which risks should we be focusing on right now. And to be completely frank, we spend a huge amount of time prioritising those risks when actually there are other methods that we can use to prioritise those risks that might be far, far simpler, such as impact against do we need to take any action to manage that risk? And if we use this form to prioritise our risks, we find that those risks that are potentially high impact on our objectives that are currently out of control, so therefore we need to take lots of action, will be the ones that plot in that top right hand corner and so immediately focus the mind to say okay what are we going to do about those to bring those risks down from that top right hand corner to below that line of tolerance where we are happy with those risks so this is a case here where i could have spent the last 45 minutes just talking about impact against likelihood and then we could all have a big argument about how likely we think something is to happen so you can do risk management that way but increasingly you're seeing organizations use something far far simpler like impact against action to reduce that initial prioritization of which risks should we focus on at this precise moment in time so that is hint number five almost there hint number six is where we want to have really clear roles and responsibilities with regards to who is the go-to person with regards to those really big risks that we have on a site or in a company, but also who are the people that own those controls that we might want to have in place in order to manage those risks. And the key thing to take away from this particular portrayal is every company does this in a slightly different way. Most mining companies really give kudos to those risk owners. And that's in part because those risk owners are generally quite senior within the organization because they need to be people who have the ability to make decisions with regards to resource allocation, et cetera, for managing those risks. But a risk owner doesn't actually do much about a risk. It comes down to the control owners and the control users. So a control owner will be somebody who actively they might either design the risk or they're in charge of making sure that, sorry, they might actually design the control or they're in charge of making sure that that control is designed properly and it's therefore of good quality wherever it's being used within the operation. Whereas the control user is the someone who makes use of that control on a regular basis. They may not necessarily understand the intrinsic detail that goes into that control, but they should know what successful working or effective control looks like because they are the ones who are actually putting their lives in the hands as it were of that particular control so the difference between your risk owner who should constantly be saying okay how can i best manage this risk what is changing with regards to the context of this risk does my suite of controls still manage the risk that i have opposed to the control owner who's looking at that single control and saying okay Given the purpose of my control and the risk or risks that it is in place to manage, is it being truly effective? And then the control user, so the person who's having to use that control on a regular basis because they're typically in the front line and that's part of their job. So clear roles and responsibilities is also incredibly important. Which brings me to the final hint or tip that I've got, which is around risk management software. Now, lots of people come and they speak to me and they say, OK, we've just bought a piece of risk management software. Now we need to design our risk management process and framework. And that's lovely. But unfortunately, we put the cart before the horse because ideally you design your risk management framework and process before you go to market to buy that risk management software. Risk management software does not manage your risks for you. It is typically just your database, it's just your repository for all of that risk information. It's the same as having an Excel spreadsheet, but generally it's probably a little bit slicker um, and it will also probably be doing some really nice reporting, et cetera, for you as well, and ideally some action management. 
So this is a case here where rather than going out and buying your risk management software and expecting it to tell you how you should be managing your risks, it is much more sensible to design how you are going to put together your principles, your framework and your process for risk management, get it to work within your organization on a testing basis and then go to market to go and find the piece of software that will actually work for you. Because there are so many risk management softwares out there, some of them are absolutely fantastic, whereas there are others that might just not be the right software for you. So risk management software, get your principles, your framework and your process right first, and then go to market to go and check out what you need. So in summary, risk is all about your potential opportunities or threats that if they happen will impact on whatever it is that you are trying to do. And risk management is all about doing something about it. There are many different processes that are out there, but the simplest process for managing your risks is that simple four step process of context and objectives, assess your risks, manage your risks, and then your monitoring, review, and your reporting. Lots and lots of different hints and tips can be brought into this, but some specific hints and tips with regards to mining. Focus on the real controls. Once you've identified your real controls, then you can work out which of those controls are critical and how you're going to verify if they are truly effective. Secondly, include risks from all perspectives, all different people across the entirety of your organization. Go as broad as possible because all perspectives are relevant and are useful to you. Risks will change through time. As soon as you've published your risk report, it's going to be out of date. So you need to be able to prepare to anticipate how those risks are changing. Bow ties are great, but they are one of a great many of different tools that we have in place at our fingertips from a risk management perspective that we can use. Number five, consider different ways in which you can prioritize your risks. Don't be wedded to using impact against likelihood. Many organizations don't use impact against likelihood. Number six, clear roles and responsibilities. This is something that is absolutely vital if we're going to get accountability for managing our risks. And number seven, don't think that your risk management software is going to answer all of your prayers. You need to work out how to get risk management to work for you first and then go to market to find a piece of software that works for you. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to hand back to the wonderful Amon to see if there are any questions. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. I, I know I've just sent you uh, one of my questions through our group WhatsApp group. <clears throat> Please feel free to uh, go to the Q&A button or if it's easier for you via the chat button um, and uh, let us know your questions. In the meantime, um, you've obviously heard me say this before, but while we wait for Sarah to have a quick look at those questions coming in, I would just like to share with you a, a fabulous training opportunity that, that Satarla is offering all of our Women in Mining UK members. They, they are offering a discount of up to 40% off of their training courses. So please go to our member portal at the WIM UK website to view all the details and, and how to get in touch. And, and we have a, a few minutes, but I want to share something with you because last week we did a little debrief uh, with Monica. If you were, if you were on the, the webinar last week, we had another speaker join us. And afterwards, when we were doing our debrief, her young son, who you may have seen in the background, um, said something that resonated with all of us. And, and we've been chuckling about it this entire time. When we asked him what he thought about mining, he said, Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. You dig a big hole and you get the treasure out. So that's his perspective on mining. And as we know, we all have our own perspective on mining. So with that, I'm gonna hand you back to Sarah and we'll take a look at some of those questions that have come in. Um, I certainly have one on compliance. Well, Amon, do you want to, um, to feed in your compliance question? We'll take you first, seeing as you're sitting right there. Right. Well, my, I guess my question is from a compliance perspective, how much of your risk assessment are you allowed, can you share with the shareholders of a mining company? <laughs> so this is something where it comes down to your internal risk reporting versus your external risk reporting. Now, ideally, in a perfect world, it would all be exactly the same. And we could be fully transparent with our shareholders 
But in reality, what we probably want to do is only share with them the most important risks or the most material risks. A materiality study is just the same as doing a big risk assessment. It's the same stuff. So that's a case there where often we are required to share our thoughts or our understanding on specific risks because this is driven by regulation with those shareholders. Um, but also it is good practice to share if there are any really big things that could impact on us going forwards. So for example, with regards to financial reporting, depending on where you are in the world. So for example, in the UK, we now have to do a, um, a statement of going concern that's always been in place that's will we be around in 12 months time from a financial perspective but also what is our longer term viability so this is where we look out over a longer period for our organization and what's actually going on with regards to that and with that we could be talking about anything from particular say social opinion with regards to us being able to mine in an area so that might be our social license to operate what about um, the climate? How is it changing in the area in which we're mining? And are we going to have water available both for our processing, but actually primarily for the local community because they have first rights to that water? What about talent? Do we have the right skill sets within the mining sector, especially as we're perhaps changing with regards to our techniques, with regards to mining, all the way through to things like, will I get my permit? So what's my relationship like with the government, for example? Now, those kind of risks on the surface would be are very common to share with our shareholders. And in fact, we get asked about them a lot in those shareholder meetings. The detail that sits below them, we're probably not going to share with those shareholders unless it's specifically required of us. So this is me not giving you a very good answer. <laughs> um, but it's a case where there are key areas of risk that it's very common to report on. And ideally, we should be sharing with our shareholders anything big that we think could impact on whatever it is we're trying to do. In reality, we're going to keep probably the nitty gritty detail back because actually it's not necessarily going to add to the story that we're sharing with those shareholders as a whole. Is that what you were looking for? I was looking for that. Thank you very much. <laughs> we've awesome. got another question for you in the chat. Brilliant. So we've got a question that's coming in here saying, do we find that um, ESG or environment, social and governance becoming more commonplace as part of that integrated enterprise risk management approach? Now, this is a, a very common question. And my typical answer is that if you are, if you've been doing enterprise wide risk management properly, you will have been including ESG anyway with regards to that because enterprise risk management goes across the entirety of your organization and all of the different risks um, as well as every single level within the organization. It's about being pulling it all together. So simple answer to that question and that is yes, we're seeing increasing focus on those ESG risks at the moment, especially because they increase in prevalence with regards to those investors as a whole. Um, now, I know that there are more questions coming in, but what I would quickly like to do is to go back to the exercise that we challenged everybody with um, at the beginning of the session um, earlier on today. And that, of course, was um, what do we think are the biggest risks faced by mining? Now, you guys have been very busy in the background, which is excellent. And here is the word cloud that you've all put together. And what we can see there are things like water, health and safety, tailings, social license to operate, all the way through to things like political instability, et cetera, coming through. Now, this is fascinating because most of these risks here are ESG risks. 10 years ago, this word cloud would have looked very, very different. We'd have had many more risks on the financial side and also on the technical side, as well as the financial side. So this is a case where increasingly we are recognizing that those environment, social and governance risks are perhaps the ones that are more important for us or the ones that need to be at the top of our agenda to manage. That helpful, Eamon? Very helpful. I, I'm quite interested in the fact that water is right in the middle there. You know, <laughs> water security is a huge geopolitical, you know, uh, narrative at the moment. So I'm glad it's up there. <laughs> Brilliant. Cool. I will go back to the slides and let you wrap up. <laughs> right. And with that, I just want to say a wonderful big thank you to Sarah and the team at Satyler for today's webinar. I'm actually going to ask 
Rose and Darmesh to put your cameras on because they are in the background and they have been helping us over the last few weeks. And um, we will be posting all of the links on our website. So if you have missed the first or the second part of this series, you will have the opportunity to go back and revisit these recordings. So for those of you who are interested in further training courses with Satarla, please do feel free to go to the member portal of the WIM UK website to view all the details or the Satarla website. And if this is your first time joining one of our events, Women in Mining UK is a volunteer run nonprofit organization which promotes the employment, retention and progress of women in the mining industry. Everyone is welcome to become a member of WIM UK regardless of gender or where you are located in the world. Please go to our website to join us now. Membership is free and please save the date. Our next WIM UK event is scheduled for the 16th of September. Very interestingly, another risk management webinar, and this time, Tales from the Trenches. So please do join us. Check out the events page on the WIM UK website for further details. Once again, a big thank you to Sarah, Rose, and Armesh, and all our participants for joining us today. Wishing you a wonderful rest of your afternoon, or if you're called dialing in from Canada, a wonderful morning, and see you all in September. Goodbye. <laughs>